The system we're dealing with is this. We have a mass hanging down here from a string that goes up through the very center of the xy plane to a mass that's restricted to moving within it. And this mass here can move anywhere in that plane. So it could go in circles, it could go in spirals, it could just fall straight in, it could move outwards pulling this mass up with it, but the string length, which we're going to call A, is fixed. It's also important to note that we're going to take this string to be massless. We're going to take its motion through this hole here to be frictionless. We'll also take the motion of this mass in the plane to be frictionless. We're also going to assume that the only force other than the string tension acting on this mass 2 here is gravity pointing downwards, meaning we only expect it to be able to move up and down. We don't expect any movement in the x or y direction. So that's our system. What are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to use classical mechanics to describe the motion of the masses mathematically according to Newton's laws. Now this is a relatively complicated system. It's not one that would be convenient to apply Newton's laws to directly. So as usual, when we arrive at a system like this, we're going to handle it using Lagrangian mechanics, which of course, if you're using the right base Lagrangian to start with, in this case t minus v, or t and v are taken to be the normal classical non-relativistic quantities, is consistent with Newton's laws. The first step in any Lagrangian mechanics problem is to pick the right generalized coordinates. We might first think that the Cartesian coordinates describing the location of the two masses would be a good selection, but that's actually more coordinates than we need. It would be redundant and therefore needlessly complicated. We remember that m1 is restricted to moving in the xy plane, so we know immediately we don't need z1 to describe it. We can just set that equal to zero and ignore it, we just need x1 and y1, and m2, because it only has the upward string tension and the downward gravitational force acting on it, is only moving in the z direction, so we don't need x2 or y2, which reduces in total six variables down to three, so we've already got quite a simplification there, but we can actually reduce the number of variables involved even more than that, because there's a restriction on the motion of these two masses imposed by the string. Specifically, we see that the z2 coordinate of m2 here will be the radius that this m1 has extended out to minus the length of the string, which we've decided to call a. Written out, we have this restriction. The fact that we have mentioned this r parameter here for the radial location of m1 as part of a convenient way of expressing this constraint implies that it's probably a good idea to select the rest of our generalized coordinates to just be the polar ones in this plane, which I've then done here. Now if you're wondering how I got those expressions, well I've drawn out the plane here turned vertical. This is the r vector and that's the angle phi. We can see using ordinary trig rules that this has to be r cosine phi and this one here has to be r sine phi, which gives us those two quantities there. Now that we have our restriction implemented and our initial variables expressed in terms of generalized coordinates, we can move on to calculating the kinetic energy. For mass 2, it's really easy. We just have one variable to deal with. It simply ends up being a half m2 times the velocity in that direction. And given this restriction, we can see that z2 dot there is just equivalent to r dot. And since r is the most convenient variable here, I'm just going to switch everything to the use of r. The calculation of t1 is a bit less convenient. I've done it in two ways. One of these is perhaps more standard, and that's just to calculate x1 dot and y1 dot, and then plug them in. Starting with x1 and y1, we can use the product rule and the chain rule to calculate out those derivatives then plugging it in, squaring it, and simplifying, remembering our Pythagorean trig identity gets us this expression for it. Another interesting thing we can do, we can look back up here and work out what r hat and phi hat are using similar trigonometry to how we found the component expressions for r vector here. That gets us these two expressions, and we already have the components for the r1 vector from earlier. 
Using that, we can calculate the derivative of r hat with respect to phi, and we find that it's equal to phi hat. And that's useful because then we can apply the product and chain rule to r1 vector to give us this expression, which we can then insert directly into t1, and we get the same result. This is perhaps a bit more technically complicated, but it's elegant and it uses skills that are important to know. So bringing them in when the problem is still pretty simple is pedagogically useful. It might seem tempting to skip over understanding this, but I don't recommend it. It is actually worth knowing for future application. We've got both terms now in the kinetic energy. We can add them together to get the total kinetic energy that we need. Next, we need the potential energy, which is quite easy. It's just the gravitational potential of the hanging mass, where, of course, we can ignore the constant part because it doesn't affect the equations of motion. And we have all we need to write out our Lagrangian, which is just T minus V. And we can now calculate the equations of motion. The R equation of motion straightforwardly works out to be that. Things start to get a bit more interesting when we calculate the phi equation of motion because we find a conserved quantity. Now somebody who's familiar with Noether's theorem won't be surprised to find a conserved quantity because they'll see that it's phi independent here, so that's a symmetry in the Lagrangian, and Noether's theorem says that when there's a symmetry in the Lagrangian there will always be a conserved quantity, so that coming out of the equations of motion is not surprising, but one who really knows Noether's theorem may be further not surprised even by the specific nature of the quantity, because you can actually show from Noether's theorem that rotational invariance, which is what phi independence is, specifically gives angular momentum conservation, and one might recognize that as angular momentum. However, if you're not familiar with those advanced concepts, or at least more advanced concepts, that's completely fine. All you need to do to see that there is a conserved quantity here is just the form of that equation of motion. And then, not knowing Noether's theorem, you might try to calculate various different common quantities in physics to see if this conserved one works out to match. And since there's rotation in this problem, or at least the possibility of it, angular momentum might be one you'd try, and it does actually work out to be the angular momentum. And from that, you'd learn that this equation implies angular momentum conservation originating from phi independence in the Lagrangian. However, because we've identified this as a constant of the motion, it allows us to entirely eliminate the phi variable from the problem. Doing that via substitution gets us this single equation of motion that describes the whole system. And we can see on this side that we've got an opposite sign, which means we can actually get a condition where the acceleration of the masses vanishes, meaning a case where this centrifugal force exactly counterbalances the gravitational force from the second mass. And I know that this is the centrifugal force term because it's a force that aims radially outward, and in this system, that's the only thing it could be. With that in mind, we can figure out exactly what m2 has to be for it to be held stationary by the centrifugal force. Setting that acceleration equal to zero as we were talking about and solving for m2, we find that if m2 equals this combination of the other quantities in the problem, we'll have a static situation. At least, of course, if the masses had no initial velocity. Because it's the acceleration we're setting equal to zero, not technically the velocity. And with that, we've learned what this problem had to teach us. Thanks for watching.